Welcome to Conversations on the Coast. And this is one of those great times when we have an opportunity to welcome back an author whom we've had on the program before, and we are still friends. Her name is Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni. She is a novelist, a wonderful novelist, and uh, she used to live right here in San Francisco, and now she's gone away. She lives in Houston, Texas. Her new novel is called The Palace of Illusions. And what it is, according to the flap, and I rarely start at the flap, is a reimagining of the world-famous Indian epic, the Maha... The Bharat. Mahabharat. The Mahabharat. The Mahabharat, told from the point of view of an amazing woman. <clears throat> now, to say that this is going to be retold from the point of view of any woman is amazing and perhaps in violation. Well, the main story, the original story of the Mahabharat is very male-centered. It's a wonderful epic. It's full of action. It's full of tales of intrigue and betrayal and war. And killing. And killing. This is right. That's what epics are about. Stabbing. But there were, there are a number of wonderful women characters in there. And when I started planning to retell the story, I wanted a woman to be at the center of it. And so she is, Princess Panchali. And that really is a, a wonderful idea, I guess. Is, is that, has it ever been done before? Yes. Um, you know, some time back, Margaret Atwood came up with, out with a book, The Penelopead, which is kind of a takeoff on the Odyssey, but from the point of view of Penelope, yeah. Odysseus's wife. So, yes, you know, I think there are other people who are retelling the stories from a woman's point of view. So, it, but this particular epic has not been told from a woman's point of view before, or, or has it? You know, yes, it has in different languages. Oh, okay. I know one other language in, in India where a woman is at the center of a retelling of the Mahabharat. And as I was doing my research for this book... I did look at all the novels that have been written about the Mahabharata, as many as I could gather that were translated into English. And I did come across that, and that was wonderful. It gave me um, a place to start with and a place to depart from to make sure my novel was different and that my novel uh, interpreted the set main character differently. The wonderful thing about an epic is that it, it, it lives orally as well as in the, the written word, so that when you start re-examining it or representing it, I, I would guess you have to be very careful in, in your research because many people uh, from the culture would you know, know when you're going wrong, so to speak. Absolutely. I had to do very careful research. There are several versions of the Mahabharata available, so I looked at all those different versions and um, yes, it, it was a big challenge because the Palace of Illusions is about a text that is deeply loved in the Indian culture and deeply revered in the Indian culture. So I wanted to make sure that I was accurate in terms of source material, but also that I was respectful, that I didn't dilute the power of the ancient story, and yet that I was doing something different and new, because that's really important for me as a writer. Now there are many uh, women characters in the in, in in the story, and and you had to make a choice, and and you chose Princess Pan Panchali Panchali Soft C Panchali. Yeah. Why? Well, ever since I heard the story when I was growing up in India, you know, my grandfather was a wonderful storyteller, and he would tell us these oral tales from the Mahabharat in the evenings, and I still remember those evenings with great fondness. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in Panchali because she is, in some ways, a great catalyst in the epic. The great war that occurs in the epic, and you know, the epic is a story of about the devastation of war, among other things. Well, this great war, in some ways, is incited by her. Well, the other reason that I think you might have wanted to choose her is her commission, if you will, 
I mean, when she's born, it is said of her that she is going to have an effect on the history of the world. That's right. There's a prophecy at her birth, which is itself a magical birth in fire, and it says that you will change the course of history. Obviously, you have to suspend belief uh, to get into this story, and that's part of what you pull off so well, because you are a very, very good and a very, very talented writer. So there's there's no problem here. I mean, thank you. <laughs> here she's coming out of fire with a brother who's coming out of fire, and she's not really wanted, and yet she's the one who's going to change the destiny of the world. The Palace of Illusions, that's the title, tells the story of a host of other characters, and we're going to meet some of them when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. The Palace of Illusions, that's the title of the new novel by Chief Rubanaji de Akaruni and is published, which we neglected to say in the first segment, published by Doubleday. Oh, terrible, terrible. Now, in the press material on this book, I'm sure it, it says rightly that, you know, this. The, the big part of the story is is the war, you know, or wars, you know, the battle. And to me, the big part of this book is this woman and and how powerful she becomes and how realized she becomes in a society where not very many women get to be realized, get to be powerful. And I think you are absolutely right, because although in the original epic, the Mahabharat, the war is what everything is leading up to, in my novel, The Palace of Illusions, the character of Panchali is really at the center. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to examine. What does she think? How does she feel? What's going on inside of her? I wanted to imagine her. I wanted to interpret her. And I wanted to invent that unsaid or unsung part of her life. Now, just to point out how unusual this woman is, she's going to change the world, and she's going to be she's going to have five husbands at the same time. That's you right. Didn't, you didn't make that. No, up. no, that is in the original, and she's the only character in all of our uh, traditional literature where, uh, and probably in all of our modern literature, where a woman has five husbands at the yeah, same time. The same time, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, uh, the novel explores how that happens. But especially in Palace, I, want, I wanted to look at how she feels about that. Yes. And she feels very, in a, very ambiguous about it. And yet she knows it's something she has to manage because it's part of her destiny. Right. And then she finds out an intelligent way of managing the situation. And she does handle all five of those uh, husbands and they're very you know, well. Very well, and they're you know they're not lightweights. They're the greatest heroes of that time. No, now she is uh, not the only strong female character. <clears throat> For example, I I found strength in in her nurse, Daima. Yes, Daima. Did, did I do that? Yes, thing? you did it great. Daima. And I'm so glad you like Daima because Daima is a character I invented totally. And uh, she is Panchali's nursemaid because Panchali has no mother, having been born out of fire. And as Panchali is growing up, people around her are a little scared of her because of the prophecy and because of the strange way in which she's born. And people don't want to get too close to her. But her nursemaid, Daima, she really takes her under her wing. And she is a very earthy and funny character. And a lot of my imaginative love went into creating that character. And she stays with her forever. She stays with which, her as much as until she dies. She's devoted to Panchali. Now, kind of on the other side, and a strong female character, is the mother of those five sons, the five husbands. Her name is Kunti. Right. And, and she really feels that uh, Panchali is, is usurping or attempting to usurp uh, her her situation. Right. I wanted to bring that in because in the original epic, we just have the situation. We have no um, explanation of the situation. So here are these two very strong women in the same household, and they both want to have things their way. So 
as I was looking at Kunti's character, um, I wanted to bring that in. What would ha- have been the relationship between these two women? And especially on Panchali's side, it's ambiguous because she admires Kunti for what she's done. Kunti was widowed when she was very young. The kids were little. She had to live in a hostile court where her husband's brother had taken the power. And, you know, they didn't even want her children to live. There were attempts over and over on her children's lives. And yet she was strong. She made sure they survived and she was dedicated to getting them back their birthright. So Panchali has a lot of admiration for that. But Panchali also realizes that Kunti is completely ruthless and she's not going to stand for anyone else becoming more important than her in her son's life. One of the things we can't forget is that all this human drama, which you've described so beautifully, is presented against a a background of incredible magnificence, incredible wealth, unbelievably beautiful palaces and 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 scenes of 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 the country that you know make you feel like you're 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 almost there now th- does that come from the original or i mean where does all this beauty come from the original text of the mahabharat is a very fine text but it evokes rather than describes because it is you know, it's telling uh, yeah, such a great yeah. and let's such get a on large to the action. story yeah. right it's mm-hmm. such a large story okay but you have added a lot to it you yes, have added, I wanted to imagine uh-huh. that world. The Palace of Illusions is very different from Ms. Devakaruni's other novels, except except for the writing. That's as beautiful as ever. And we're going to prove it when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. The book that we're talking about today is The Palace of Illusions, the new novel by Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni. It is published by Doubleday, Publishers Weekly, says in part, vivid and inventive. Devakaruni's rich, action-filled narrative contrasts well with the complex psychological portrait of a mythic princess and a number of other characters. And if you will, for me, the male lead. <laughs> the male lead was a fellow by the name of Yudhishthir. Yudhishthir. Yes, Yudhishthir. Uh, who who uh, it was the the first of the born of the five of the five brothers, and there were some thumbnail things said about him. He has a passion for righteousness. Uh, he ran after impractical goals. And at the very end, it is said of him, he's the only one capable of shedding his humanity and going into heaven, I suppose. Where does he come from? Well, he is very much there in the original, the Mahabharat. And actually, he is one of the great heroes of the Mahabharat. Ah. Now, in my version, in the Palace of Illusions, which is told by his wife, Panchali, she sees him slightly differently. Um, she does admire him. She does admire the fact that he loves righteousness and he loves truth. But as you might imagine, living with that 24-7 can get a little difficult. Yes. So sometimes she gets yeah. somewhat you know, annoyed with the him. The other thing is that Princess Panchali uh, holds throughout the story... I would say an extremely high ideal notion of romantic love, and this it's, is true. It's, it, it's like, and as a consequence, no one who's quote available unquote can satisfy that, and so she pines for two people that she can't have. Right, and especially Karna, who is one of the other great heroes of that time but who belongs to the other faction. Uh, So he is one of the enemies of her husband's. Now, she saw him before she got married to the Pandavas, and she has always been fascinated by him. And Karna is a truly tragic character, a great hero who, because he was abandoned at birth, has always suffered since then, because we're talking about a, a... world in which lineage means everything. The family you belong to means everything. 
His yeah. abandonment at, at birth, I'm sorry, immediately made me think of Moses. Yes. You know, no. the ancient stories the ancient often stories, have yeah, they many have connections. Yes, uh, connections. Like a little bit of the writing. Uh, toward the end of the book, uh, there's what I would call a uh, self-portrait by Panchali. The more people dissuaded me, the more determined I became. Perhaps that has always been my problem, to rebel against the boundaries society has prescribed for women. But what was the alternative? To sit among bent grandmothers, gossiping and complaining, chewing on mashed beetle leaves with toothless gums as I waited for death? Intolerable. I would rather perish on the mountain. It would be sudden and clean and end worthy of bard song. My last victory over the other wives. She was the only consort that dared accompany the Pandavas on this final fearsome adventure. When she fell, she did not weep, but only raised her head in brave farewell. How could I resist it? And I think that that's wonderful. It kind of sums it all up that she's a, she's a person of, of deep feeling, and she's as stubborn as all get out. And, you know, she's... Yes, that's right. She's going to get what she wants. Yes, and she's at once heroic but fallible, right? Because she wants to go on this great journey, but she wants to do it better <laughs> oh, yeah. than the other wives. <laughs> uh, there's a, a, another passage toward, toward, toward the end, uh, which I think gives us a kind of understanding of Yudhisthira. Uh, it was a lonely life he'd led all these years, set apart from those he loved most by his passion for righteousness I'd been foolish to let it infuriate me, this is the, the princess speaking, to wish that he would give up his stiff, silly principles. Righteousness was his nature. He couldn't give it up any more than a tiger can give up its stripes, and because of it, he would go on, abandoning his dearest ones in the moment of their death to the ultimate loneliness, to be the only human in the court of the gods. These are These are... Are, are people, you know, pulled at by destiny's power, and right. and torn apart by it sometimes, yeah. and and they're and they're hurting, they're hurting one another, and uh, there's a there's a final note uh, from Krishna. Uh, she asks him. She's always been asking him this throughout the book. She's asking Krishna, "Are you truly divine?" Will you never be done with questioning, Krishna laughs, like the small brass bells tied around the necks of calves. That sound will remain with me even when hearing has gone. Yes, I am. You are too, you know. Ah, this is a read. This is a book. <laughs> Go out and get it. It is called The Palace of Illusions. It is by Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.